All right, hello everybody. It's Peter Miller uh, for the third episode of Psychologist versus God. I have with me here today um, uh, an infamous uh, individual, in my opinion, in terms of the, in the world of science. Someone who I really enjoy uh, talking to and has taught me a lot about um, things pertaining to environment, ecology, and um all the various issues that um, humans face in that regard i'm meeting with dr guy mcpherson he's a conservation biologist social critic thought leader and expert witness dr guy mcpherson is an internationally recognized speaker award-winning scientist and the world's leading authority on abrupt climate change leading to near-term human extinction as professor emeritus at the university of arizona he has delivered presentations to thousands of people at dozens of universities and colleges on four continents. Uh, McPherson's published works include more than a dozen books and hundreds of scholarly articles. Dr. McPherson has been featured on television and radio and in several documentary films. He is a blogger and cultural critic who speaks to general audiences around the globe and to scientists, scientists students, educators, and not-for-profit and business leaders who seek their best available options when confronting Earth's cataclysmic changes. So that is uh, that is a mouthful. I mean, <laughs> I mean, sounds like I was. Sounds hey. like you have a great guest today. <laughs> <laughs> I think I do. Um, uh, one of my favorite people again to talk to, um, and uh, thanks for joining me on this um, this new adventure of um, exploring. Uh, religious belief, spirituality, and how it intersects um, in a sometimes good way, sometimes not so good way with mental health, mental illness, that kind of thing. Um, so, Guy, um, you have been on this earth now for how many years? How old are you? <laughs> I'm 62. I've had 15 birthdays. <laughs> I was born on February 29th. That makes me a leapling. So I had 15 birthdays, and I've been here 62 plus years. So I, I mean, another human citizen on this planet Earth, and you have been through all the the typical rungs that we all go through. I guess when it comes to uh, childhood development in the what should we call it, the industrialized first world? I guess right. Uh, yeah, although you know, I was born early enough and lived in a village long enough that the, you know, I didn't even know there was such a thing as civilization for the first many years of my life. I grew up in a village in northern Idaho that was, oh, three and a half hour drive from the closest real town. And most people wouldn't consider that a real town even today. So it was a relatively sheltered existence. My parents were teachers. My my dad was a principal and then a superintendent of the public school system. And I have an older brother and a younger sister. So it was a it was a fairly mm, interesting experience in seeing the transformation of this country as we went through the American Cultural Revolution which I think happened in the late 1960s or the 1970s when there were all these riots and protests all over the country. And it seemed like, you know, if you were on the campus of Berkeley on Sproul Plaza in 1968, 1969, you were on the leading edge of people protesting the Vietnam War, trying to raise awareness regarding environmental issues, also trying to get rid of some of the prejudices that come with civilization, such as misogyny and racism. And of course, I didn't know any of that because I was growing up in this village and in really the middle of nowhere. So the American- In a bubble, so to, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I knew everybody in the town I lived in and everybody knew me. And you know, I could stay out until the sun went down, which in the summertime was, 9 30 10 o'clock at night and and it was no big deal people kids like me were just hanging out in the town playing with their friends and and 
chasing adventures by way of the small stream that went through town or playing in the forest and on and on. So it was, on the one hand, a very privileged existence, although my parents were stunningly poor from a financial perspective. And, but, but there was a sense of, you know, it takes a village to raise a child, that sort of thing, because everybody knew me and I knew everybody. And so there was no getting in trouble because if I did anything that was wrong from the parental perspective, I had the equivalent of a couple hundred parents watching me all the time. So it was an interesting experience. And then I went to undergraduate school at Pocatello, Idaho, Idaho State University, and then graduated from Idaho, the University of Idaho in Moscow, Idaho, and went to graduate But before, school. before all that, if I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to capture like a segment of your childhood, like, um, in that small place, in that in that um, place, sort of separate from all the 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 cultural ragings in, in, of society in the world, were you was there a particular um, belief system, religious worldview that you were indoctrinated into at at all, or? Well, yeah, um, <laughs> one of the three large sawmills in Weipe, Idaho, a, a town of about seven hundred people with three large sawmills. So, so that tells you where we were in the age of extraction, basically, cutting down every remaining large tree. Anyway, we lived on a gravel road, and every Sunday, Mrs. Hutchins would walk by. Mrs. Hutchins was the mother of the Hutchins brothers who ran the sawmill. And she would walk by every Sunday morning. She was going to Sunday school at the Wesleyan Church and, you know, given the size of the town, it was only a two-minute walk. And so she convinced all of us, so far unindoctrinated children, to follow her along on the Sunday school routine. And so I did that and stayed with that church until probably I was 14 or 15 years old when I, when I started high school. I started to think that there's something wrong here, that this just doesn't match with my uh, what, what I see and what I experience and what I read in terms of reality. So I, as I recall, you know, it's been quite a long time, as I indicated. I've been here 62 years, and this goes back to quite a few of those years ago. So but your as, parents didn't didn't have a, a belief system that they tried to share with you. It was it wasn't, wasn't like that. No, no, no. They they believed in God, but they weren't going to church. My dad was okay. an alcoholic, and my mom probably would have drank more, except it so badly affected her gout. So she had she had intense physical pain if she drank even a little bit. You know, we knew everybody in town, as I indicated. My my dad was very close to the teachers he was working with. He was the principal. They were the teachers. We had a party at our house that was really a drinking party every weekend, and all the teachers would come. So I knew my teachers really well, and probably too well from their perspective, because I'd seen them do things they probably weren't too proud of when the next day rolled around. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but no, there was no real pressure in terms of attending one of the three churches in town. I just got snagged by Mrs. Hutchins or Mrs. Hutchinson, whatever. What were the was. three churches again in your town? Oh man, probably like Catholic, Protestant, and something else. No, there was no Catholic church. The closest Catholic church was was in the nearby town, which was about fifteen miles away, and. And our neighbors went there. They, they, they were the only Catholics I knew growing up, which is pretty amazing, given the preponderance of that religion in this country. Uh, I can't remember what the other two were. Okay. Uh, what, it, it which was, one did you go to? You, so I went to the one? Wesleyan Church, and as near as I can tell, that was and is a, a sort of middle-of-the-road Christian church. You know they don't they don't speak in tongues. It's not stunningly conservative in its approach, as nearly as I can tell. But you know, so long ago, I don't remember much of what was happening to me at that time. It just seemed like a cool thing to do. I remember one of my friends, Jerry. I don't remember his last name. 
we were in this Bible school session, and he just kept badgering the the leader, the adult in this group, with questions that today I would consider really good questions. But at the time, everybody just got really annoyed with Jerry because he was asking, he was saying things like, well, just because it's in the Bible, does that mean it's true? Is that is that where we're, the road we're going to go down? And, the, and the, the instructor would talk about faith, and Jerry was like, no, I want facts. I want I want something here. And it was pretty interesting because everybody in there, everybody in this Bible school class, including me, thought Jerry was a real jerk. Like, don't do that, man. You're supposed to be polite to your elders. Have you learned nothing in church? (laughs) Right. (laughs) (laughs) But now I realize that Jerry was asking all the right questions. He was standing up to the... The moral authority, right? The and it was he, and he was asking serious questions, right? He was he he wasn't trying to be obnoxious. He just had these serious questions. How do we actually know something is true? And mm-hmm. it's a fine question for almost any time, any place. And constantly pointing to the Bible is not a way to positively influence somebody like Jerry. And ultimately, I think that's what sort of wore me down too because the answer was always the same and there wasn't much it sounds like in your case you were kind of lucky like there wasn't much social pressure for you to conform to anything like you could just sort of experiment with this uh and sort of try it out like you you didn't have family pressure around you going like you know you need to be one of us be part of our tribe yes that's true there was you know from a family perspective there was no push to follow a religious path my parents were believers, but they you couldn't tell it by their weekly drinking parties. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So and uh, I don't and know. at a certain age you were you were just sort of sort of done with it, is that what you mean? Like, uh, yeah, well I suspect it happened <clears throat> gradually, as with everything in my life when it comes to my thought processes. So I suspect you know People talk all the time about having an epiphany, and I don't recall having very many epiphanies in my life, and certainly that includes with respect to going to church and following a religion. I think I, uh, I, was, I was taken by Mrs. Hutchins, or Mrs. Hutchinson, this older woman who, who was inviting, right? Who was inviting me to be a part of something bigger than myself, and I suspect so far in my life that hadn't happened. And and so then it was happening, so then I, I got to be part of something, and then the longer I was part of that something, I, I, I came closer and closer to realizing that it wasn't something that I wanted to be part of. And the main thing was that it just didn't logically kind of make sense? Is that right. why? Exactly. It just, you know, I, I finally figured out that Jerry was asking reasonable questions, and he was not getting reasonable answers. Mm. And mm-hmm. at some point, that just wore me down. And, and so I opted out. Also, I suspect, though again, it was quite a while ago, I suspect that the, the other kids my age were going to their churches. And then ultimately, when you get to high school and you start learning more about the the reality of the world and take a rational approach that you just realize that this something about this just doesn't add up and so why should I spend my time participating in these things that to me don't make sense anymore so I suspect mm-hmm. there was a lot of that going on with the entire group of people I was hanging out with and so it became it went from being uh, a gathering where I was welcome to be part of something bigger than myself to something that, yeah, it's still that, but it's something that doesn't make a lot of sense. So, hmm. and and also, you know, I was be- becoming part of other communities. I was very active in sports. I was in the National Honor Society. My, I was a member of the band. And so I had all these other communities that I was part of as well. So I didn't really need the church as something to embrace me and make me feel like I was a wanted human being. Mm-hmm. Seems like it's something that's uh, always sort of been like there, if you know what I mean. Like it, I, I look at it as, as kind of like a, like, and when I say what's been always been there, it's like there's been 
you live in in um, in a world of people where there's a portion that are uh, highly interested and devoted to their beliefs, and then others who are questioning, and others who want who don't want to have anything to do with it. So there's always. In, in my whole life experience, it just seems like there's been this push pull. Like, are you going to believe? Or are you not going to believe? Are you going to, are you going to go down this road, or are you going to, or are you not going to go down this road? And if you don't go down this road, we're going to keep asking you to come back to this road, <laughs> right? Well, and that's what I see in this culture, over and over, is duality. There, there are two ways to do things, right? There's the right way and there's the wrong way. There's the 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 route that everybody else is taking or the wrong route. And so this idea of duality was, I, I was starting to question that when I was in high school. Surely there's more than two ways of doing anything, right? And still I see that duality. I suspect that, that it is uh, part of our DNA that we just can't escape. You know, we hear these things all the time, flight or fight, right? That's, that's two paths. And, and if you manage to survive long enough by f fleeing or fighting, then you have children or you don't. You're either a parent or you're not. And how do you raise them? Do you raise them within a religious environment or not? You know, so it seems to me that we very, very, very frequently promote and accept the idea of duality. I started to seriously question that when I was in my early 30s and I was an assistant professor where in, the, in that role you get to do what you want. It's the perfect job because you get to do the work you want to do. You get to teach classes you want to teach. You get to conduct the research that you want to conduct. You get to recruit students to work with you and so on. And so that leaves a lot of time for thinking about what you're doing here anyway, right? So a lot of people just go through life and they just follow the, the path that seemingly has been laid out before them by civilization, the one true path, without really giving it much thought. And so I was in this pretty privileged position where I got to figure out what classes I'm going to teach and how I'm going to teach them, what kind of research I'm going to do, and, and who I'm going to be. And so that led me from the early 90s till probably the late 90s to spend a lot of time reading self-help books and getting in touch with ideas like Buddhism and Hinduism and expanding my intellectual and cultural horizons in ways that up until that point, it had been a treadmill, like this set of living arrangements is for most people. We just jump on the treadmill, we go fast as we can to try to get all the stuff we think we need. And that's the definition of success in this culture, is the one who goes fastest, right? <laughs> yeah, and when you say this culture, like, and I'm thinking, like is that when you say this culture i mean that that includes a few items right like uh like it involves it includes the god narrative probably uh it probably includes being a, becoming a good capitalist uh you know being learning the, the rules of the game um, so that you can have things and prove yourself quote unquote right like is that, is that are those some of the things that you're talking about? Yes, absolutely. The the cultural pressure to get along, to go along, and act like the other people, is profound. I mean, you you try mm -hmm. to do any seemingly insignificant thing differently than other people, and they just start to get these sideways looks, right? Yeah, like uh, in in the last few months of my life, I've been really like being a rebellious asshole I guess <laughs> it comes naturally going, to some of us I, yeah, like yeah, you know uh, yeah I was going to say you know like me and you I think we shared certain things in common when it comes to maybe some personality traits and um, um, facing down facing down uh, 
powers and authorities. I don't know. Do you think we might have that in common a little bit? Yes. Um, and and it, and that's costly. That's expensive. Yeah. Like. Um, yeah. Like every Sunday now, I do these podcasts, and it's like I'm I'm have a hard time. I'm I'm like judging myself as like I'm I'm just being an asshole. I'm not just doing what everyone else is doing, right? You know, you're um, Jerry. You're Jerry from my I'm youth. Jerry. <laughs> And, and everybody at the time thought he was an asshole, and so everybody today is going to think you're an asshole because you're, right. you're you're doing the uncommon thing. You're doing the wrong thing. You're questioning the unquestionable. Yes, like having the conversations that people don't want to have. So I'm, you know, it's like I'm doing the same sort of thing, just at a slightly different angle uh, than what you do. You know, you talk about the, the difficult things too. Um, and I, and, um, yeah, I didn't mention everybody guys got an awesome blog called nature bats last and it's guy com. So if you want to, um, see and learn from, from what he has to share. Um, so anyway, like, so we, I mean, we can definitely see the overlaps there in where we're coming from in terms of, um, thinking about things and uh, challenging things. And um, not being kind of like, it's more important for some reason for people like us to like take these risks, these kind of these social risks. It's like, it's like, I, I would rather talk about this and figure this out. I would almost like rather do this than worry about losing anything else. Like it's pretty profound. Like, uh, I don't know why it's so damn important to me. <laughs> Probably because my life experience is like, uh, as I mentioned in my first episode, but. Right. Something, you know, just gets in you and, and you, it's like you have to follow this path. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, <clears throat> from my personal perspective, I have very little left to lose because uh, of a well-coordinated defamation campaign that has destroyed my public life. I have my integrity. I have a wonderful woman and perhaps the support and love of a few other people. That's it. You know, I don't have to worry about losing a paycheck. I that that's long behind me. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so I'm at this point unusual in this society that I have only myself to impress, to please, to to get along with. You know, the the face I see in the mirror at the end of every day is the only boss that I have, the only supervisor. And that came obviously at a, at a tremendous cost. And so far it's been worth it. But we'll see if I end up starving to death. Then I would say it wasn't, it wasn't worth it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean um, being in, uh, having this type of curiosity and having these urges to communicate about these taboo subjects um is uh it does come at um certain prices and costs and and uh gosh yeah i and don't even know if it's worth it i don't, i just can't help it right right. <laughs> right well that's the thing you and i are of the character that we can't be any different than we are and i would go along with the general neurobiology and intellectual community that says we have very limited free will, that we are the way we are because of our personal history and our genetics, our DNA and our personal history. And we didn't have any control over either one of those. And so the way we act, and, and, and as I say this, I already regret saying it because on the one hand, I want to claim that I'm fully responsible for my own actions. And so is everybody else. But on the other hand, I think our, uh, our free will, our ability to actually make decisions is predetermined in almost every case. And so, <laughs> so, that, so that leaves me intellectually struggling a lot because I encourage people to do the right thing and not be attached to the outcome uh, lessons I learned from Buddhism and Hinduism. And at the same time, I think that in 99.9% .9 of the cases, plus or minus, 
we don't have the ability to make the kinds of choices that we think we're making right now. Mm -hmm. So that's annoying. So here's a question, and I just thought of it, and I, I think it might lead to some interesting thoughts. So in, uh, if you look at my blog and you look at the challenges I'm posing to um, the God narrative religion, uh, you know, like, and I would, I would very much uh, love to talk to someone who has an opposing viewpoint as me. I'm just putting that out there. If anyone's listening to this podcast and they're like super believer and they see my challenges and they see, think I'm, you know, like I'm thinking about it wrong, like, please come on the podcast. But anyway, like, so guy, like in a way, like, and in the, the ways you've tried to face down the scientific community, it's almost like you're up against the God narrative. <laughs> isn't, isn't that true? Right. Absolutely true. Absolutely, because th there's this idea, not rooted in evidence, that we that the planet has warmed to a certain point, and there's a, a whole bunch of things we can do to cool down the planet, and that none of that is rooted in evidence of any kind, and I see it every day, today, today, for example, uh, that the. the among the last remaining social media I'm on is LinkedIn, which is said to be the, the professional, the, the, the truth only, right? It's not about personal feelings. It's not like toxic Facebook and Reddit and Twitter and all that crap. And so some, somebody tagged me on LinkedIn, a like guy appropriately named David Crookall because he's a crook who actually stole money from me. Anyway, and he tagged me. He keeps asking if I'll connect with him on LinkedIn, and no way. He tagged me, and then before I could even untag myself from that ridiculous thread, I see people like Catherine Hayhoe, who's a professor at Texas Tech University, claiming that we are at less than 1.5 degrees C globally, and that there's this list of things we can do. So here's a so-called scientist who is claiming these things that are not rooted in evidence whatsoever, but people just, they just glom on. They think that's wonderful. How do I sign me up for that? Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. almost every aspect of our society is there's this route you go down or you're the bad person. And, I'm, and I had this other thought too. Like I'm wondering as we're, trying to have these conversations as we're trying to be honest about how humans are, what's happening in human life. And like, I'm really curious about how, how uh, religious institutions can influence mental health for better or worse. And so I really want to be honest about that. And you really want to be honest about how humans are influencing the environment and the consequences that are uh, inescapable. Um, so we're up against four things in my opinion, and I just thought of this, like, we're, we're always up in these discussions, we're all, always up against lying, lying through omission, uh, gaslighting, and logical fallacy. It's like, those people use those things as ways to make arguments, right? And, but the thing is, like, most people, and I've realized it's, I like, I didn't even really know, like, there were, there's actually like 15 logical fallacies. Um, I thought there were just a couple, but there's like 15. Uh, there's so many ways that people can distort information and distort truth. And I was like, it's like, if you're going to have a good conversation, it's like, you need a referee. Right. And exactly. they, they can, they can watch and they can be like, oh, you know, ad, ad hominem logical fallacy, like two minutes time out for you, Guy McPherson. Right? Like, like, I don't even know if I can see when I do it. Like, I don't know if I'm that consciously aware. Of course. Of you know, we, we can't all have a degree in logic, right? <laughs> Most of us don't even take a course in logic. I didn't take a, a course in logic in, you know, through three degrees, bachelor's, master's, PhD. I didn't take a course in logic. How, how can I call myself a scientist if I haven't even had a course in logic, right? And yet, <laughs> essentially, nobody who has a PhD has taken a course in logic. So you're right, there's so little that we know and so much that we don't know. <laughs> How did, 
I can't believe we made it this far. <laughs> 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 On so many levels. <laughs> Like, how can you sort out, you know, the discourse? How can you actually have an effective discussion and argument when people do that? Right. Like, and they do it automatically and unconsciously, I think. Like, Absolutely. Know? And that's the very basis of social media. Is, I mean, if you're not gaslighting somebody, what are you doing on Facebook anyway? What's right. the point? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you're not... If you're not putting out some kind of logical fallacy, right? Like, like I've been, I've been, I've been posting like these quotes from books because I like to do that just because of it. Just it's just, I just find it amusing, and I don't know. It seems to be okay. This is an actual thought. It's not just like some either or thing. I don't know. I'm, I'm that's how that's how I've been engaging with social media. Um, but I should probably try and quit because I, you know, I mean, I've. I mean, I, I really do believe that it's probably bad for the brain. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's pretty interesting because after that little exchange this morning, I was thinking, why? Why do I remain on LinkedIn? It's as ridiculous and toxic as Reddit, which, which I've never even been on, and Facebook, which is, and Twitter, which I was on for far too long before I bailed out of them two or three years ago. And <laughs> I mean... Oh, there's so much nonsense spewing everywhere you look that, and why would I spend my precious time looking at that sort of stuff? Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and yet, that's what we do. That's what we do in this society is, or everybody I know is checking their phone to see what happened on Facebook today. It is a, a, a major major issue that I, I I don't even know if people can honestly face like uh, uh, about it being addictive in nature and uh, how much time is wasted and how your thoughts can get so warped and distorted and polarized and like there's so many bad things about it right but I guess people are like well I'm just going to focus on the good things <laughs> right you know, my phone, and probably yours too, probably most phones do this, I don't know. My phone actually keeps track of how much time I spend doing everything on the phone. Mm -hmm. Right? And so it keeps track. How, you, how long are you on social media? Well, I was on social media before I opted out of the Facebook and Twitter and all that other stuff. I was on there for 10 hours a day. And I tell people all the time that they should live with intention. Really? <laughs> Really, I'm on Facebook for eight hours a day, and I'm telling <laughs> other people to live with intention. That's crazy. <laughs> and imagine, I mean, I like to just put this out there for anyone who's interested in children and parenting. Can the, de the developing brain cannot develop normally if it is always that looking at a screen? It right. The the, the brain only develops normally if if the if the if the human organism is interacting with the world and touching things and moving things and. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> uh, and so, keep, so going back to where we started, you know, that's how I spent the early part of my life. I was touching things. I was playing in the woods. I was trying to chase garter snakes and put them in a, in a jar, you know, and I was actually interacting with the natural world. And how many kids get to do that these days? Mm -hmm. You know, every, every time I see a kid, it, it, he or she is leashed to a parent to make sure they don't get more than six feet away. It's incredible, really. And the, the magnitude of change that occurred has occurred in my lifetime is just astonishing. But maybe that's just because I'm a slow thinker. I don't know. <laughs> Things seem to happen, yeah, they've happened rapidly in the last hundred years and so many changes. I don't know if we can actually keep up to it, to be honest. Um, so yeah, I'm wondering like where to like, you know, like how to harvest your experience here, like in uh, the things that, you know, that you've seen in your life and just so it can be um, somewhat applicable to my, to my um, podcast theme. Mm -hmm. um, have you in your experiences um, seen people or known people involved in uh, belief systems that have um, had it? unexpected harmful consequences has that ever been part of your travels yeah oh yeah okay so 
Um, I'm going to make this personal because that's the only way I can answer the question, I think. Uh, I, I went from being a, this, this young Christian to not knowing what I was doing in my life. And then by the time I finished graduate school, I was pretty firmly um, a non-believer. And I was an agnostic, as all scientists are supposed to be, because scientists are not supposed to have a personal life, and there are certain questions that science can't answer. Can't answer. So I was agnostic. And then, oh, probably about the same time that I was reading those self-help books in the early 90s through the late 90s, I came across something called The New Atheists. And these new atheists are led by people like Sam Harris, for example. And uh, the other names don't come to mind. Uh, Lawrence Krauss. Uh, and at least half a dozen others. And these are people... What's, what's different about the new atheists is they aren't like the old atheists. They aren't like I am or most other non-believers I know. They just let it go. right? The new atheists are bulldogs. So they go on the attack as rabidly as any Jehovah's Witness that comes to your door, right? They just don't put up with any irrational thinking. And so they just go, in my opinion, way overboard. And so I was in that camp for a while because, again, it's one of these things that there was this profound sense of community. It resonated with me from a scientific perspective. I could see that religion was having um, undue consequences for a lot of people around the world. And so I thought, yeah, we need to attack these, these jerks who are the religious leaders. And then I thought about it a little more, and th that's going into the same camp, different door that I was in before, right? Mm -hmm. That it's just these very angry people attacking a belief system. Just let it go. So now I fall into the Buddhist expression, let go or be, or be dragged. Mm -hmm. you know, and I just, I don't tell people what to do. And I don't think that I have it figured out either, but it works for me here and now. And this is what we have is here and now. And so that, that I have at least come to a conclusion for today about a way of living that allows me to look myself in the mirror at the end of the day and also be reasonably happy as I proceed and also retain my um, integrity. Uh, that's, that's about all I can hope for at this point. I think I'm mm -hmm. there. So the attachment is the root of suffering is sort of the, right. the mantra kind of thing that you're living by right now. Yes. Absolutely. And of course, you know, we have, we all have these personal histories, right, that, that take us down these other paths. Like I was raised a certain way to believe certain things, among them that drinking alcohol on a pretty regular basis is a great idea. So <laughs> I don't think so about some of those things. But how do we even know when we're making these conscious decisions is one of the things I struggle with all the time because I grew up a certain way in a certain place at a certain time in history I was hearing all these messages I saw people smoking cigarettes on television we don't do that anymore but I came to think that that was normal because that's what was happening when I was a kid uh, it, it's so it's so difficult at least for me I think for most other people try to figure out how they're going to spend their precious short time on this beautiful planet. Mm -hmm. And and there are so many mm -hmm. definitions of integrity. You know, you can get the church version, which says you have to give 10%, right? You have to do the tithing thing. Or whatever. There's, <laughs> there's as many different ways to live as there are people to live. And we so seldom acknowledge that as we try to get along with everybody else in the culture. These two ideas might be like part of that duality. I was just thinking like, so some people, they, they live for the afterlife and then the others are like, no, I'm going to live for the now. 
right? And uh, you know, if you're going to live for the now, then you're, then you're, um, I don't know, you could be really judged for that, right? Like you're not, um, you're really disrespecting God by not um, preparing to meet Him, kind of right? Thing. And disrespected by a lot of people who are in the believer camp, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. He, he's living in a way that is inconsistent with the Bible. Mm-hmm. And yeah, people can really get caught up in it. And I'm just fascinated actually right now by beliefs. And um, I've just been like buying books like crazy on Amazon. And I can't, there's so many things I want to understand about humans and belief and how they, there's so many ways you can get pulled into believing, right? Uh, there's been there've been so many like groups and cults and uh, over the years, and uh, I know in the '60s and '70s there was a whole bunch of different ones that I I'm not aware of, but I know that that existed. And um, uh, it's almost like humans need, for some reason, they need. There's something in them about needing to believe and needing to have faith. It's like it's part of uh, our makeup, right. but then if we if we go about it, if we if we focus on it too much, it can become tyrannical. Um, and I guess the same thing could be said about reason and logic. Like if you focus too much on reason and logic, that can kind of become tyrannical too. And uh, like like the that atheist group you were talking about kind of sounds like right. The new atheists who, you know, it's. It's not as if, and I haven't kept up with them for 25 or 30 years, it's not as if they are pointing out that there is the, only their way to live, too. Or maybe they are. I don't know. I don't think they're calling for people to become terrorists on behalf of the Antichrist. <laughs> right? So... so <laughs> So I don't think they're pointed in quite the opposite direction. Right, of, right, right. Of the religious... Uh, uh, they just believers. like to have debates and stuff like that. Right, right. <laughs> you know, I, I read this book, The Lies We Tell Ourselves, by John Fredrickson. And yes, love that book. There, at the end of the book, um, he has a section on letting go. And that's at the very end of chapter five. And so... You know, that resonates with me, but I suspect like so many other things I read, most notably the books I read, I pick out the parts that resonate with me. I pick out the parts that say, oh yeah, that's me, that's right. And then I ignore or don't notice the other pieces. And so probably that gets in the way of my education and most other people's as well. Hmm. Pick out certain pieces. Okay. You know, because I read this book, it's what, uh, 168 pages, and I eared one, two, three, four, six, six pages. Six pages had something that was especially noteworthy that I was underlining or, or checking off the important part. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there must be more than that in a 168 page book. Um, but uh, I suspect that's how most of us absorb any information is, oh, that part, that, that's good part. That's, that's part of, that appeals to me. And then an, another six hours goes by and we see something else that resonates. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know how we can overcome that because that clearly that plays into our own prejudices. Yeah, we're all biased in a way, right? Yeah, absolutely. Except for the new atheists, of course. They're not biased. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, I said that out loud. (laughs) Yeah, being in that angry mindset, I don't mean, that's not, that doesn't sound like a a very fun place to stay. No. And I I don't want to stay there either. Like, and I think part of my experience in my history, like, in doing these podcasts, I'm trying to, like, engage and learn from people like you know like how do you how do you live as a human like being both a logical being and sort of a a a mysterious magical being like how do you how do you do that in a healthy way (laughs) because i don't know if i don't even i don't know if people actually 
know how like or if they if they talk about if there's a way to be both spiritual and rational reasonable at the same time you know is that can people actually do that (laughs) well they claim they can (laughs) is it possible to balance this <clears throat> because well, it seems like it's we're always getting flipped one way or the other, right? Right, right, absolutely. And, and that's, again, the Buddhist Hindu way is to just try to find that balance. It's all about balance. It's all about figuring out our place in the world without being an asshole. Yeah. Right? Because we could all do that. That's the easy way. Is there a part of you, honestly, though, like I know that you've focused on the science and the and the logic and the facts and the, is there a part of you as a human that wants to just believe in something or to have faith like is that is there a need in you like that or would you say you can go without that there there certainly is a desire you know i don't want to come to the end of my life and have there be something on the other side right after i die and there's this person with wings who says well McPherson looks like you had a bad 62 years we're going to have to (coughs) throw you into hell (laughs) hope you're okay with that (laughs) obviously I don't want that to happen and this is one of the reasons that my integrity is so important to me and is among the few things I have left to lose because uh, I could be wrong it's happened before you know, I think most of us can probably say that, that we've been wrong a time or two in our lives. And the evidence tells me that with respect to supreme beings, gods, spirits, that sort of thing, that I'm not wrong. But how do we know? It gets into that arena of the kinds of things we can't possibly know. Mm-hmm. Right? And so at some point, we're, we're obviously doing more than flipping a coin. But is it better than flipping a coin? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, like, that's what I'm honestly trying to, um, you know, open up with people. Um, some, sometimes I have thought of um, religious belief as sort of like, like an addiction. Like, a person has an existential anxiety and they need a way to relieve it. So... Mm-hmm. They find a belief system and then it answers all these questions and then no more existential anxiety, right? So, and then they have to keep getting, you know, like getting, getting boosters, booster shots by going every Sunday or other meetings so that they can keep relieving the existential anxiety, right? Like, (laughs) that's that's one of my, that's one of my asshole thoughts, right? (laughs) Yeah, we need more booster shots, you know, and... Because of the path I've taken so far and where it, it has taken me, um, I'm I'm an agnostic when I'm doing professional work, when I'm doing my writing and most of my speaking. But in my personal life, I go beyond that to the point of atheism. And then I read people like Edward Abbey, who's an atheist, who was an atheist. And, and he wrote, the fear of life follows from the fear of death. A man who lives fully is prepared to die at any time. And were he not such a misogynist, he might have included women in that category as well. But mm-hmm. So I'm trying to live fully because I think this is all there is. And by living with integrity, maybe I'm just hedging my bets so that if St. Peter shows up after the final time I close my eyes, I'll at least be able to say that I lived with integrity, if not with belief. So, so is it is it like fair to conclude like from where, from your life experiences, where you come from, where you grew up and everything that's happened over the last 62 years, like, and all your evaluation, like have you come to conclude like that, uh, like religious belief and all that, and all the, all the varieties of that are, um, like just a human concoction, a waste of time, uh, delusion, uh, dangerous, like in terms of how they can lead people to be fanatical and fly into buildings and so on. Um, is that's it, a tough is question. That, is that where you, what's your opinion on, I guess, just religious behavior at this point? 
Uh, I think there are nearly 8 billion different examples because there are nearly 8 billion people. And some people clearly have taken religious thought, I'm not sure that's the right word, have taken their religiosity a few st steps too far. And I'm thinking of, was it David Koresh in, oh, yeah, in, yeah. in Waco? Mm -hmm. um, and, and there are cults, obviously, that have formed around religious leaders, but I don't know that Donald Trump is a religious leader, and I think there's a cult that has formed around him, too. So, uh, it's one of these things that's really difficult for me to comment on. I think that uh, almost any prescription for living can be carried too far. Whether it's the notion of the Jehovah's Witnesses or atheists, and here I'm thinking specifically about the new atheists who have become, as nearly as I can tell, as hateful as religious fanatics who believe that other people are not worthy of continued living because they're not acting in the right way. I think we can get, in other words, I think we can get to the point of taking completely irrational actions by going down either either of those two paths and probably everything in between, right? Mm. That, <laughs> that logic, if, if we're able to stand back at a distance and see people acting in these certain ways, then we can say, oh yeah, well that's ridiculous, and oh yeah, that's stupid, and blah, blah, blah. But when you're in the heat of the moment, when you're in one of those groups and you're feeling like you have a profound sense of community, that these are my people, well, that's different, isn't it? I mean, that's, we, we all want to be part of something that's bigger than us. And that, I suspect, is why these movements arise. That's why there's such a thing as the Christian church and Islam. And that's why the new atheists exist as well. Because they're, they're playing to our psychology, to our, to our way of thinking, and trying to bring us into the fold, whatever that fold means. People love to feel that sense of belonging, right? That sense of acceptance. It's like tribalism, kind of, right? Like, uh, they want to be part of, you know, that's why people join gangs, right? They want to be part of something, like a group, right? And, uh, and, and that's I, probably I, coded in us. Absolutely. I think that's almost certainly one result of evolution by natural selection is we want to be part of something. Of course we do. And Dunbar's number, 150, 250 people, depending upon the environment, is the, the size of community we can create and be part of that doesn't get completely out of hand. Because at Dunbar's number, we'll just say roughly 200 people, everybody knows everybody, so nobody can be an idiot. At least not for very long. And that's like the village I grew up in when I was a kid, right? Everybody knew everybody, or at least close enough, so that nobody could be an asshole, or you'd mm. get called on the carpet. You know, mm. if, if I was doing something wrong, my parents would get a phone call. And there was no such thing as a cell phone back in those days. People were just looking out their windows, and, oh, there's that McPherson kid again. I better call his mom. <laughs> So you got to be kind of mindfully aware as a human, like where your beliefs could take you, right? Like, I mean, I think there's always potential for any probably type of belief system to turn into a form of mental illness. So if, if you're going to join a group and you're going to attend a meeting and believe a certain book and do certain rituals, like be careful <laughs> because, you know, it could turn into a type of uh, OCD or other kind of mental illness or it could... It could influence your behaviors in ways that you might regret. You Absolutely. Know? Absolutely. And I see that everywhere. I saw it in academia. You know, there's this prescribed set of steps that if you complete them all, you will become successful. That's how we define success is people following these steps. 
publishing just the right number of papers and just the right journals, teaching just the right material and the classes and blah, blah, blah. And uh, so I think it can happen anywhere. I think we can create that um, need for community and need to belong to community in almost any mindset. And I think we have. <laughs> yeah, it's probably in, yeah, how many varieties of belief and belief systems in churches and blah, blah, blah. Like there's just so many, right? Right, absolutely. Uh, and that's probably just an expression of the, you know, the human organism. It's just, there's so much diversity, I guess, right? Um, but maybe, I guess what I've, I'm just hoping that people will pay attention to and think about more, like with this podcast, is how it can go, how it can go in an unhealthy direction. Like, I don't know if people are willing to pay that kind of attention, you know, because it did some serious fucking damage to my life. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's kind of what I'm standing up for. And also as a mental health therapist, like, I just think it's important to talk about these things. Like, does, you know, people have this assumption that, well, you know, going to a church and believing in God and it, it holds your family together. Like, well, not always. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, <laughs> kind of thing. And absolutely. There's a woman I've known since I was six years old. Her birthday is the same day as mine, which is unusual, right? February 29th. And uh, she was raised in the Mormon church. Or, uh, I'm, I'm probably saying that wrong. It's the Church of Latter-day Saints. Yeah, and, close enough. <laughs> and, and she was, as I recall, she was married in a temple, which is, you know, well down the path of being in the right camp. And she's been married a couple of times since then. And I don't think that fits the prescription for that church. Right? And mm -hmm. so obviously she's had some very difficult times. You know, because she was part of this thing that was bigger than her and it was really important. I saw it every day when we went to school together. This was very important. And then somehow, obviously, she's not part of that community anymore. And she survives she goes on she seems to be having a perfectly happy life and and yet mm -hmm. there was this thing that she believed for such a long time and she clearly is not in the in the group anymore and that's that happens to people all the time but we don't even know about it right people have been kicked out of one community and they're in another community or maybe they're not and that's where their anger comes from is they're not part of anything bigger than themselves anymore and every, I think everybody wants to be that, don't they? I think we all want to be part of something bigger than just mm -hmm. me. Very few people can live as a hermit alone yeah. with their own thoughts. I certainly can't. No, and that's probably important to acknowledge too. And but to be able to do that responsibly, I guess is the thing. Like, how do you uh, embrace that part of your humanity responsibly? And how often do people not take enough responsibility for that part of themselves? And um, I guess I would just yeah, that's what I'm really curious to hear more. If there's people out there who have ha who have stories about how belief was not taken responsibly or how it led to mental illness or or how it was taken responsibly how like how the hell did you do it right, <laughs> right. so that it didn't go so that it wasn't too too much one way or the other so you had a nice balance of yin and yang you know like how did you do it right uh, there's isn't that a buddhist idea Oh, yin and yang thing. <laughs> yeah, I better be careful how much uh, <laughs> concepts I try and put into the same pot. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, this yeah. has been an awesome discussion, guy. Yeah, I always enjoy talking with you. It's I, it's hard to be human, you know, and we have such short lives. I, Carl Sagan said it well in his Cosmos book, published September twenty eighth, nineteen eighty. For small creatures such as we, the vastness is bearable only through love. And we're small. We're nothing in the in, in light of the cosmos, right? We're we're a single individual on a pale blue dot, as Sagan put it, in a universe and probably a multiverse. 
And so how do we get through? We, obviously, we all long to be part of something bigger than ourselves. We long for that sense of community. How do we strive for and succeed at being part of a community without becoming David Koresh or one of his followers? Mm-hmm. I mean, life is tough. Like any anyone who's talking about any any um, who's arguing for anything, like even your your group, right? Like people could they could latch on to your group and become an extremist, right? <laughs> like a nature bat's last extremist, and it's probably happened. Yes, absolutely. And I'm accused of causing the suicide of anybody who was reasonably active within the nature bat's last group. This is one of the reasons I'm not on Facebook anymore. Is I just don't want to have any of I don't want to have anything to do with any of that and yes people have a profound need to belong to something larger than themselves and balancing that with integrity and with the with the concept of love for other human beings and other organisms that's tough this is Life is quite a challenge. <laughs> it is. Just one after another. Do you have any, any like, concluding thoughts on, like, like I was asking before, like, if you're going to involve yourself in something, some sort of group or um, syst- thought system, like, how, how do you do it responsibly? How do, you, how do you maintain your mental health while also belonging to a group that uh, has some good things about it like um you know how do you do that and um do you have any concluding thoughts there i'm afraid not really i mean who who said i i wouldn't be a part of any group that would have me right so that's something to think about i you know obviously we all as as human animals we all need to be part of something bigger than ourselves we have this sense of longing for interaction with other human beings. That does not mean we have a sense of longing to become a mass murderer or a member of a cult. And so how do you find that balance? One person at a time. That's all I can think of. Mm -hmm. It's recognizing that it's very difficult to be a human along with near the eight billion other humans on the planet, each one of them striving to find their own way and being screamed at by this culture to succeed, succeed, succeed. And what that means is make more money. How do we, how do we even make it this far? (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, the, the, the dominant cultural, uh, program. And we've, I've talked to you about this in the past. I mean, is, you would probably agree is a big contributor to the environmental dilemma and and uh, near term uh, extinction of humans, right? Like it's the because of the 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 buy in, the cultural buy in to that system of ideas about wealth and materialism and what it means to be acceptable. Like it's because of. I mean, the, I guess depending, no matter what other religion you belong to, you might still belong to, like, the cult of capitalism, if that makes sense. Right, absolutely. I, th- I think we all do at some level. Now, how do we even break away from that? Everybody wants to have a roof over their head. Everybody wants to have clothes to wear. Everybody wants to have food to eat. Everybody wants to have water coming through the taps, right? I mean, I don't know very many people who don't want any of that. I, mm-hmm. I, I strove for something different spent more than a decade living <laughs> off grid that worked out well <laughs> well i mean it probably is truthful that we if i mean the way humans have done capitalism whatever in the last 150 years has been very extreme and unbalanced right like like we haven't done it consciously we haven't done it in a way where we maybe wouldn't destroy things so fast like or yes. maybe we could have come up with some some ideas to be more sustainable but because we're so like hyper focused on uh, increasing the, the, the return on investment right here. Right. Absolutely. We are driven to succeed and we define success as money. 
And mm -hmm. if you can't see anything wrong with that, I think you get serious mental problems. <laughs> because, well, you know, yeah. you can't take it with you. We're all going mm -hmm. to die. And in our final moments or hours or days or I don't know how long, in, in the end, I suspect that we're not going to remember how much money we made. I suspect we're going to remember the interactions we had with other human beings and maybe with the natural world. And that's mm -hmm. about it. So I try to encourage people to spend more time with those they love, to spend more time with the natural world, if that's what you love, to take the long hike. That's where you can connect with the real, with the reality that is the real world. And Carl Jung had a quote about living consciously. Um, I don't know if you've ever... Um, I, I bet he had more than one. Him. Or yeah, he has lots of good ones. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, so he would say, I, there was one really good one that I liked, um, that um, if you, it's basically a, a big part of our problems are that we live unconsciously. And that's where a lot of the evil or bad things stem from. The way we do things, you know, like ineffectively or poorly is because we're doing them uh, without conscious awareness, without self-awareness. So we don't kind of do that along with meeting our needs in other ways, right? We just do it sort of on autopilot and we're not really practicing self-awareness as we do these other things. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah. that's, I think that's the definition of the set of living arrangements. We strive to impress other people, mostly ones we don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? And, and the, to... to to think about that for a minute makes you realize how unconscious we all are. Right? I'm trying to make money to impress people I don't know. <laughs> what? Right. Yeah. So I can feel a sense of self-acceptance that actually <laughs> that actually won't even give me self-acceptance when I get there, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like after after celebrities make like 200 million dollars, like uh, like I would love to talk to Jim Carrey like cuz People think about him as like a crazy guy now, right? Like, because he talks about like uh, being aware of the ego and and, and uh, you know, like just being part of everything, and you know, so now he's kind of been put in the crazy bin. I think right. for, from, from some people. And Robin Williams, same kind of thing. Robin Williams started out as this funny actor, and he became more and more serious over time. And pretty soon, he was in sure he was demanding that homeless people be given jobs on every movie he worked on. You know, so so he and Jim Carrey, these funny guys, right, have become serious people and are serious in a way that leads to being conscious of the way we act toward mm -hmm. ourselves and toward other people. Like um, the idea of, you know, like when he says there is no Jim Carrey. Right. Um, because, um, I mean, he's looking at the, um, the notion of self as being a construct and like I'm quite interested in that too. Um, and it, it, there's an awesome book called the No Self Help Book. Uh, I can't remember the author right now, but it, it's uh, like it's like forty ways to get over yourself. It's a really awesome book. <laughs> Check that one out if you're interested. But um, right, that sounds great. Are you? What do you think of that stuff? Do you do you look at like the sort of like the notion of the self as being a construct and that we're just part of the we're just part of everything? Or uh, yeah, do you think? I mean. You know, there's there's two extremes, as with almost everything we identify to, right, in this society. And so at the one at the one extreme, you could argue that we can't even identify where we start. Right? You have pores on your body that allow air in and out and also sweat, perspiration comes out. How do you identify where you begin? and where the world around you ends. You can't. From a rational perspective, you cannot say it's right there because right there it just moved, right? And on the other hand, I want to take responsibility for myself and I want to encourage other people to do the same thing. So that means I, the one, the self, the me, has to take responsibility for the things that I, the one, the me, that I do, right? And so it's, it's again the challenge of 
overcoming binary thinking and trying to find another way through this. It's not either or. Maybe it's both and. Maybe right, we right, are yeah. individual selves responsible for our own actions. And also we're a part of something greater. We're part of the nearly 8 billion other people on the planet. We're part of an ecosystem because we're human animals within an ecosystem already. And we, right. we depend upon those other organisms. How do we pay that back or pay that forward that we get our food from pollinators and from the plants and so on? Yeah, I, like it's that uh, that paradigm where there's the person outside the circle of all the animals, and then the person inside <laughs> the right. circle of animals. Right? Uh, that's the the different um, worldview, right? And uh, where all, a lot of the beliefs um, stem uh, in terms in that regard. And like you're saying, both and, and like I'm thinking of uh, uh, mental health. There's a system called dialectical behavior therapy, and it's um, from Marshall Linehan and the most effective treatment as far as I know for borderline personality disorder but it's it really gets you to focus on being dialectical like doing the both and like there's mm -hmm. just like it isn't there isn't always just one way of looking at things it's like both ways have validity right and you have to learn how to be dialectical so anyway yeah so many different tangents we could talk about right and yeah <laughs> I could yeah, pick your brain all day are. right <laughs> absolutely and yeah, we gotta live too. <laughs> yeah, we have responsibilities so as as part of a family and part of society. Yeah, yeah, I, I really appreciate how you've been able to tie in uh, your life experiences and thoughts about the environment and how we've been able to weave it together in terms of like um, like just some really good thoughts and uh, insights about how to be human without like um, making a gigantic mess, even though humans largely have already made a gigantic mess. But may, you know, maybe if we had started talking about these things 150 years ago and really you know, learning how to take responsibility for ourselves, it could have had some major impact, but. Right, and some people <laughs> were. You know, the Buddha, mm -hmm. more than 2,000 years ago, having these conversations, and uh, the dominant narrative just trampled humanity. I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We didn't. We didn't really learn how to take effective responsibility for to meet all of our needs, right? Like we just um, we did it in a we did it in a destructive way unconsciously, right? right. I guess we could say. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. We're we're best at being unconscious. <laughs> <laughs> and again, if you want to learn how that all plays out environmentally, from I think the most honest ecologist on the planet. Go to um, guymcpherson.com. Well, thank you, Peter. And I um, it. yeah, and uh, if uh, I would um, invite you, anyone listening to, uh, if they would like to further this discussion and share their story, to please contact me at uh, Peter Miller P S Y C at uh, Gmail dot com. P S Y C right, so, for psychologist, obviously. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or just find me on Facebook, whatever. So. It's been great, Guy. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you and for the uh, conversation. I appreciate it. I'll be uh, chatting with you potentially again sometime in the future. We'll see. But take care, okay?